Good afternoon. My name is Corey Walker, and I'm the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities and Director of African American Studies. And I want to thank you for joining us for today's program, George Floyd's America, a public conversation with Robert Samuels of the Washington Post. It's indeed an honor to bring you to bring you, have you join us for this program, which is sponsored by the program in journalism, as well as the program in African American studies at Wake Forest University. I'm joined by my dear colleague, Phoebe Zerwick, who's director of the journalism program and an award-winning journalist herself uh, here at Wake Forest. And Phoebe will introduce our featured conversationalist today, Robert Samuels. Phoebe. Whoops, I was still muted. Thank you, Corey. Um, so Robert Samuels is a national reporter for the Washington Post, which means that he travels the country looking at how politics affects people. In other words, about the human impact of our public policies. Um, that role led him to report on the murder last year of George Floyd. Samuels was part of a team of reporters at the Post that won a Polk Award for their six part series, George Floyd's America that examined quote, systemic racism and racial injustice in the post civil rights era. Samuels is now working with another journalist, Toulouse Olorunipa, on a book on Floyd's life. His name is George Floyd, One Man's Life and the Struggle of racial just for Racial Justice, to be published by Viking Books in May. He has also made time this semester to teach a deep dive in our journalism program in race and the media, and I believe some of his students are here this afternoon. I'm thrilled to bring him to a wider audience here at Wake Forest. And now I turn it over to you, Robert. Thank you. Thanks, Phoebe. Uh, this, is a, this is a thrill for me and a little terrifying. I've never had to do a public conversation before whilst also taking attendance. Uh, so I'm paying a lot closer attention to the attendees list. Uh, Phoebe went over my biography pretty in, in depth, in a pretty in depth manner. Uh, yesterday actually marked my 15 year anniversary of working as a journalist. I started at the Miami Herald and I now work at what the Washington Post where I've been for 11 years. Uh, and what I try to do is I've always tried it, to put a human face to stories that are complicated that really occupy our minds in hopes of bringing a better public conversation to the space. Uh, about a year ago, I worked with a bunch of my colleagues to produce a series of stories that looked at the life of George Floyd. But more so than looking at George Floyd's life, what I hoped the series, what we hoped the series would accomplish was to illustrate how systemic racism tangentially, tangibly, uh, uh, tangibly operates within the human structure and within American society. And it turns out that George Floyd at 43 years old uh, had lived a life and his family had li lived a life that hit so many of the markers of a black family that had been hobbled by systemic racism from a history of black land loss uh, to being in one of the most segregated school systems in the United States, to being in a housing project that was choked off from all opportunities, to encourage to um, having a body, having a health, to interacting a health system that was unable to help him uh, once he fell into drug dependency. Now we're working on a book about George Floyd that expands this series and. You know, sadly, I can't talk about all the folks who you've interviewed uh, because they are under embargo, but it's a pretty good list. There are about 350 people who have participated in this story. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some folks who have will be a part of this story and also what that tells us about where journalism is today and what it means for American democracy. Now, so I've shared my screen here. I hope you can see it. Uh, so this is one of the main people who I've been speaking with. Uh, this is Philonis Floyd. Philonis is George Floyd's youngest brother. Uh, and he was a truck driver, a soft-spoken man, 
until the day his brother died when he felt a call to activism to try and get justice for his brother. He's probably now the most well-known member of the Floyd family. If you notice here in this picture, he's not wearing a tie because when we took this picture uh, sometime in September, Philonis was still at the point in his life where he did not feel comfortable wearing a tie because just the pull itself reminded him of what happened to his brother, George Floyd, who of course uh, died and was murdered by a police officer when he kneeled his knee, he put his knee on his back for nine minutes, killing him and setting off a global movement. In the middle of the global movement was this woman. This is Courtney Roth, she's in the center. And Courtney was George Floyd's last girlfriend. Uh, she says she was the love of his life. Um, now, Courtney occupied a very strange space because she loved this man, but she was also a white woman in the middle of a movement that was geared toward Black lives. And she tried very hard to figure out what her right place was in the universe. Courtney, in the book functions as a mimesis for so many uh, white people who are trying to figure out what their space is. And of course, she felt the pain closer than another, than most others. This folk, this guy is, uh, his name's DJ Hooker. Uh, DJ had never met George Floyd. Uh, he was a chess coach and he worked at a local library and he was so stunned by what he saw on the video that he began to go to protests and soon he began leaving, leading the protests. And one of the things that we do is we sort of like look through his eyes in terms of what happened that spurred a person who had no real interaction with George Floyd into this type of activism. But the person that I really want to focus on today is this young woman right here. Uh, she has thought given many interviews to the media, including myself, but she's really important to the story. Her name's Darnella Frazier. Darnella was 17 years old when she was walking toward Cup Foods that day on May 25th, 2020. When she saw Derek Chauvin kneeling into the neck of George Floyd, she pulled out a cell phone and recorded a video and posted it on Facebook, that, which was the video that went viral that showed this horror, this tragedy, this gruesome incident to the rest of the world. Uh, the estimated count of people who've seen Darnella's video now is around 50 million, 50 to 100 million people have seen the video. She prompted the movement through bearing witness. The big question for a person like me is, does a person like Darnella Frazier, a 17 year old who has just taking her child to her cousin to buy some snacks at Cope Food. Does she count as a journalist? Well, she did win the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, what the Pulitzer Prize committee said in their citation, which was a special citation, was they gave it to Darnella for courageously recording the murder of George Floyd, a video that spurred protests against police brutality around the world highlighting the crucial role of citizens in journalists' quest for truth and justice. The emphasis added is mine. What we saw with Darnella Frazier's video was a critical moment in a different type of understanding of how we handle race in the media and how journalism should function. Because not only were there reporters who had gone to journalism school and worked for outlets like mine there, many of the most important things that came out of it came from videos like Darnella, but also came out of local citizens, uh, places like Unicorn Riot that just went around the city recording videos of marches and water wave TV. People, none of them had any journalism training but they produced some of the most important bearing of witness that we had seen throughout the entire throughout the entire period that we now call the great racial reckoning. So what does that mean for when we think about our jobs? I'd say the difference between what happened with Mike Brown 
who died in Ferguson and a person like George Floyd, what's the presence of, presence of citizen journalism, right? That there are black people who took the idea of what happened into their own hands. They took a video, George Floyd had a video, Mike Brown did not. And for most of the while, when whilst everyone was thinking about Mike Brown, they also thought, well, uh, did he really have his hands up when he said? Some witnesses said yes, some said no. Uh, because Darnella Frazier and, we had, and the advent of the cell phone, we knew precisely what happened to George Floyd as it was happening. Now, in my class, we talk a lot about this guy. This guy is not alive. He was not around for George Floyd's death, but his name's Gunnar Murder. Gunnar is a, was a Swedish uh, economist who in 1994 produced a, talk, produced a book that was very impactful called The American Dilemma. And what Myrtle talked about was that the oppression of Blacks to white people in the South was far greater than most people imagined in the North. Now, why this was important to journalism was that he said that if the press did a better job exposing the lives of Black people and the struggles they faced, America could help solve its dilemma, that journalism had an ability to help quell racism. Now, this also went into the idea that a journalist was a surrogate of the public, right? That they could go to places where other folks could not go and produce stories and telltales that other people were not empowered to do. The question is, in a world in which everyone has that power, in which that democratic obligation to the First Amendment does no longer simply rely with journalists, but to anyone who like Darnella Frazier has a camera. What is the role of a person like me? What do we do? What should we say? Are we any different or are we any better than someone who took a video on a way to get snacks and won a Pulitzer Prize? Now, I think the solution, the answer, uh, leans into the values that we've long had as journalists and to be able to proclaim them clearly. So the first one is that the difference between a citizen video when it comes to the idea of race is that, you know, the journalist who works for a legacy news organization like mine, we have to seek fa facts robustly and rigorously on all sides. And then we have to report them clearly and fairly. Now, this doesn't mean both sides is in he said, he said, this said. This means an honest and earnest search for the truth and then reporting what that truth is. The second thing I think that's really important is that we have to be clear to readers about our intentions. We have to talk to them about why we're reporting on what we're reporting, their rights as journalists, their rights as subjects, right? Whether or not they, have, they should talk to us, whether they could say no, what on the record or off the record means. You know, the things that politicians in Washington know that typical people typically don't know. We have to be able to have those conversations before people to feel empowered to make decisions about speaking with us. It makes things more fair, more honest, and it enshrines a trust between them, but not just them, our readers who are expecting us to be able to call balls and strikes. And the third thing has to do with our inner voice. Now, Toni Morrison used to say there used to be a, every, people like to write as if there's a little white man on our shoulder, right? Uh, and that's our imagined audience. That's the person who our voices sound like when we're writing. That's the person who we imagine writing to. In a more diversified world, I'd argue that you cannot just have a little white man on your shoulder describing, in deciding whether things are fair or right or objective or true or false. You have to consider different types of people, different types of life experiences, diverse life experiences, so you can have a better understanding of how stories are received, what to do, and how to buffet and support and amplify citizen journalism to make sure that what we're getting is not truly fake news, but something that can embolden democracy. Now, with all that, um, 
I know there are a bunch of questions. I hope there are a bunch of questions. So we can have a little bit of a conversation. Thanks so much, Robert. Uh, thank you for that that presentation, as well as beginning to contextualize the very nature of our conversation today. Uh, we want to invite uh, those who have gathered with us to join us uh, for Q&A. If you have a question, uh, you can submit it right using the Q&A uh, tab right at your lower uh, left, lower bottom of your screen. Uh, just click on Q&A and add your question. Uh, but first, we're going to engage in a conversation and we'll begin with uh, Phoebe. Now, Phoebe, uh, you have a question for Robert. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, so I, of course, I run a journalism program and I'm a journalist. So I love, uh, Robert, what you had to say about what our role is as journalists, especially in an era when everybody's got a cell phone that they can shoot video with, right? And I, I suppose, you know, the, the series you and others at The Post produced to me really shows us what our role is because what we can do is go and look beyond um, the video that a citizen journalist produces, right? And so I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about, you, you talked about that our role is to seek facts, to do so transparently, and to think of an audience beyond the little white man on our shoulder, right? Yeah. So um, I think that the reporting journey that you took to for your part in George Floyd's America, which was um, um, titled Racism's Hidden Toll, it was a look at healthcare. Um, I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about how you came to find um, the Turning Point Rehab Center and just more generally about your reporting and interviewing process because it really speaks to what you were just talking about. Sure. Uh, when we started thinking about George Floyd's America as a series, uh, it's an idea that came from our editor, Steven Ginsburg. And Stephen had divided uh, looking at systemic racism in a, through a bunch of different lenses, one of them being healthcare. Uh, and he asked, he asked me to do it uh, because I had done earlier reporting on coronavirus, and, which was very haunting and very impactful for me. Uh, we had known George Floyd had coronavirus and we had begun to examine the different kinds of health institutions in the places where he lived. <laughs> And uh, so we learned about the hospital where he was born, the hospital where he went as a kid, hospital where he died. And along the way, uh, it became clear to us that George Floyd did not simply go to Minneapolis just because he liked it. He had gone because he had gone to rehab. And that directly had to do with health. And uh, so then through some other reporting, I had learned that he had gone to a place called Turning Point, which was a place that catered specifically to helping to heal black men through a culturally focused type of rehabilitation program, which struck me as interesting because it was the first real indicator that George Floyd had known there was something distinct about his presence as a black man in the world that re required a, different sort of approach. Uh, now, the, because of HIPAA laws and just the general fear of what would happen in the trial if something mean was said about George Floyd, uh, when I called the folks at Turning Point, they told me under no circumstances would they talk to me about George Floyd. But I asked them if they could just tell me how the program worked because I thought it was exciting and I thought it was interesting and I thought it could help people understand some of the systemic problems in the ways we treat uh, black people, you know, which tend to lean toward criminalizing them, sending them to jail, as opposed to treatment of them. You know, we saw this within uh, the crime bill where they had allocated $270 million for programs for uh, black people, for black people and healthcare, mental health and drug use issues. Uh, and they didn't fund those programs when they funded all the prisons. Uh, so they said yes. And after a while I started sitting in on some of the recovery classes with a group of men who were all trying to rid themselves of their dependency to drugs and alcohol. And I sat in the back and one day someone said, what's that guy doing over there? 
And I got up and I told them who I was and what I was doing. And someone said to me, do you know you're sitting in the exact same spot where George Floyd used to sit, right there in the back, in the back right corner. And because I was there, all the people there wanted to tell their stories about George Floyd and who he was and how how much he was trying to improve his life, not just for himself, but for his family, for his children. Um, and that began a really interesting reporting journey in which I started to understand a bit of his internal spirit, a bit of his soul, and how he very much wanted to be seen beyond his body, the, that intimidating 6'4 muscular body that he had. Yeah, well, I really love that story because it speaks so well to um, the idea of going out and reporting and following the leads that you develop as you're reporting. But I also see that Corey is about to say something, but he had his audio off. <laughs> Robert, you, you, in your presentation, you talk about how you want to contextualize this George Floyd moment and contextualize journalism uh, to this call issued by uh, Gurna Mirol uh, and the American Dilemma. But at the same time, there's sort of this double edge. Um, there, we get this fatigue, uh, and America has consistently gotten a racial fatigue when these events have, have occurred. I mean, you can think of when Martin Luther King spoke about the white backlash during the Black Freedom Movement. Of course, when we think of what happened with Rodney King in the 1990s, and of course, throughout the 2000s, we had a number of these incidents, some of which did receive um, video treatment, Walter Scott in South Carolina. But there's something you, you know different about George Floyd. How do we account for that? And then how do we develop a um, sustainable ethic within contemporary journalism to not treat it as the episodic moment, but a continuing crisis afflicting the very core of American democracy? Yeah, those are two really interesting points. I think the first thing that I think it's important to recognize is that there's a certain brutality that came with the up close nature of Darnella Fraser's video and the length of it, right? Uh, but we had seen horrifying videos before. I'd argue that there was nothing really different about the video itself that changed America, but we as Americans had been changing, right? We were, we were able to focus on this actual issue because nothing else is going on. We're in the throes of a pandemic. Uh, sports were canceled. TV shows were canceled. You couldn't leave your house. And you couldn't escape the reality, the sad, unfortunate reality that so many Black Americans have to endure every day. That's a big part of it. Now, I think when we think about the terms of making these things not seem episodic, right, a part of it has to do with how we report all the other issues. One of the things that we talk a lot about in our class is that so much of journalism up until four or five years ago, when it came to the reporting on race, had to do with an experiential thing. Look how Corey lives today. <laughs> Look how Corey Walker lives today. Here is the life of a Black professor, you know, without actually bringing in the historical context of what, what it meant to, be a, to get tenure, the, dis the difficulties, the systemic issues that make your life is so interesting to a broad section of readers. And so one of the things that I think we need to do is first to be able to not just think about issues in isolation, right? But to connect them with issues of the past, systemic issues that have not been covered or not been covered well by media. You see this a lot in uh, places like the Kansas City Star that are doing these reimaginings and these reassessments of how they covered racial unrest and segregation in the past. I think the second thing that's important is to be able to not just isolate uh, the coverage of people of color limited to issues of race and racism. A part of the reason why I think it can tire an American audience is that you're only seeing people in a particular context. One of the things I talk about was one of the joys of one of the newspapers in, during the pandemic was I uh, opened our health section 
And the story was about how people had gotten hotter during the pandemic. Some people did, I suppose, because they were using Peloton bikes or whatever. Um, it was just a, the idea of the person who got hotter was a black person. You know, <laughs> just the natural course of life that they're included, that every, people are included and enveloped in every facet of society. And I think making sure that not just stories about police violence um, include the looks and voices of certain people, but that they're embedded within every type of story can help address some of those issues. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, that's been a criticism of uh, newsrooms for as long as I've been a journalist that um, I, I was in the newsroom at the Winston-Salem Journal here, so locally, and that we too often only wrote about uh, Black communities when there was a crisis or a crime or a problem and didn't elevate um, Black members of the community just in the normal coverage of day-to-day -day events or in feature stories or health stories or, or, or just in, in our normal coverage. Um, which makes me think though, and also that the too often black journalists and black faculty members on campus and um, black professionals are sort of required to, to speak for black people. So that black journalists are brought in to write about black issues as opposed to bringing in a black journalist to write about the economy or you know, any other topic. Um, but I'm wondering what it's like to be a black journalist in America today and what's, um, how that's shaped the way you report stories and how that's both helped and hindered you. Yeah, well, I, uh... I often say to this question that I'm not sure I can fully answer it because I've never had the experience of being a white journalist. Um, but there are some things that I've noted, right? And one is just, you bring your personal experience and your lived experience to the lens of what's important to you. And over the course of my career, I've often been told that I bring something special to the party or see things in a unique way. It never felt unique to me. But I think what they were speaking about was, you know, my experience and my sort of preternatural understanding of what it's like to be in a community that's been misrepresented, to have dealt with stereotype and unfortunate stereotype, uh, to have people presume things that just aren't true. I think. Um, just my lived experience as a Black person in America has, uh, one, made me more optimistic. It's allowed me to see the better side on sometimes terrible situations. Um, it's allowed me to be more skeptical about certain issues. And it's allowed me to think about um, ideas in different ways. And uh, one thing that I think people are starting to realize is that isolating race as a story isn't particularly helpful. You know, you need to look at race and stories about climate, about the economy, about business and finance, about national security. Think about what's happening now with the advent and the influx of white terrorism. You know, um, and I tell people often that I'm often, when I'm out reporting, I'm likely the first Black journalist someone has ever met. Uh, sometimes I'm the only black person in the town where I'm reporting. I'm sometimes the first black person one of my sources has had a serious conversation with who sat out on their, on their couch and had a drink of water or used their bathroom. And that uh, is something that I do think about and I'm sure it's something they think about because uh, they tend to want to talk to me about America's racial issues, even if I don't bring it up. Um, I think one of the things you might be alluding to um, is, you know, there have been some terrible, not so great situations when I was rec uh, reporting on a Trump rally in 2015. Uh, I was reporting on a group who had gone to protest the rally and they were kicked out. Uh, the, and I was mistaken for a protester and, uh, the next thing I knew, uh, I felt 
two back two hands on the small of my back pushing me out saying I was a protester when I showed them my ID they didn't believe me uh and as I was leaving I heard people chanting and calling me a monkey which was terrifying now one thing I like to tell about this story is when I explained to my editor what happened that day uh he said how are you feeling and I said to him quite frankly I'm just glad I'm alive I made it out alive and he thought I was using a turn of phrase and you'll never make it out alive but I actually meant I'm glad I'm alive because I knew that if something had happened to me that uh my good works would you know take a back seat to what ever people in that crowd which on that day was filled with known white supremacists part of a legal case um had said that I did and there would be no actual recourse and that frightened me and it also reaffirmed one of the fright one of the frightening experiences about living life as a black person in this country that if you're not in the wrong if you're in the wrong situation without people who can vouch for you that the results can be terrible and that your legacy might be tarnished Robert, you touch on a, an important point, not only in that story, but also in, in your response to uh, Phoebe's question. You talked, you really expanded our vision around how we understand race, that the conversation on race in the media tends too often to myopically uh, focus on what African, Amer African Americans as pathology, as problem, uh, or as crisis. But what you uh, underscore is the ways in which uh, race is operating. Uh, both white people are raised, black people are raised, uh, uh, Latinos are raised in quite different and dynamic ways. And that our conversation on race in the media uh, does not encompass the varieties of ways in which race operates in our contemporary society. Talk to us a bit about how journalism uh, can begin to uh, develop a more flexible, uh, nimble language around race in, in American society, particularly uh, given the virulent uh, rise of uh, white supremacy and white terror, uh, particularly in our political moment. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the first things that uh, I do in my class is I do a PowerPoint presentation of different stories. And the first question is, is this story about race? And what makes a story a racial story? So, uh, and one of the tricky slides, one of the more controversial slides is that if there is a story about a debate within the Black caucus, is that story about a race? Is that story a race story? You know, my argument is not inherent, right? Like politicians fight all the time, just because they're Black, does that mean the story becomes about them being Black? It can, maybe. So I think one of the things that we have to do when we think about these questions is really consider a few things. I think one is considering audience, right? Who's receiving the message? Who are you speaking to? And when you're thinking about them, are you writing about stories in a way that honors their existence and their, <laughs> their ability to live and their actual thoughts? Are you actually having a conversation in the questions you ask? with your readers? Are you channeling your readers when you're asking questions? Second thing I think that journalists don't think often enough about is relevance, right? So um, how relevant is someone's racial identity to how they operate in the space in which I'm reporting? You know, and uh, that question is often asked of people if they're minorities, but it's not really fully asked of people who are white. And uh, you know, Myrtle said the Negro the Negro problem is actually a white man's problem when he in 1944, Toni Morrison, you know, in fiction talked about the fact that racism is a white man's sickness. And yet there's no <laughs> real discussion about how whiteness operates in different spaces. And I think one of the things that journalists needs to be better at doing is asking questions of race to people who are not black uh, because there's an opinion, uh, there's a point of view, and especially now there's an heightened awareness about how different folks operate in different spaces. So I think that's a, that's a part of it. The other thing, so you have audience, 
you have relevance. And the other thing is the absence, right? The criticism. It's like, sometimes you look at stories and one thing that I really encourage the students to do is to think about what's not there, you know, to think about the language that's being used, how a person is actually framing the idea of the characters they're writing about, the descriptions they try to use, the things they point out, the quotes they use, you know, we're not ever showing a an audience, the entirety of a person, we're showing them a distillation of what we think is relevant to a reader. And so a part of this needs to be asking the questions of ourselves about what am I not asking, which is why in most interviews, the one of the last questions I ask is, is there anything that you want to tell me that I didn't, that you didn't tell me? And then the next question that I ask not always, but probably 95% of the time is, tell me what you think the best part of being an American is and what the worst part of being an American is. It doesn't matter who. I always ask that question because I think it starts to get people thinking about their identity and how they operate in this sort of bizarre, complicated country in which we live. And uh, even if it doesn't seem relevant to the story, those questions often, uh, influence the way I write about the person. Yeah, before Corey and I continue, I just want to make sure the audience understands how to submit questions. So at the bottom of your screen, there's this little icon that says, has two bubbles and it says Q&A. And that's where we would like you to put your questions. We would really love, um, questions from the audience. I could see that there were a lot of students in the audience and some other faculty, and we really, really welcome questions. Um, and I thought maybe some people hadn't seen how to do it. Um, now I've lost my train of thought, so I'm going to turn it back to Corey uh, while I find my train of thought. Oh, thank you so much, Phoebe. Robert, uh, you you spoke about Darnella Frazier, a uh, 17 year old going to the store uh, with her uh, 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 little cousin and just going to get some candy for the day, you know, get a, a, a small snack. Darnella joins a long line of uh, African American children who be, who are on the front line and the battle for civil rights and the battle for human rights in American history. Talk to us a bit what it means when, when you begin to write about Darnella uh, as, as part of this long genealogy of African-American children on the front line, what it means for uh, African-American uh, children, African-American girlhood to enter into this space. And then the, the real, the interesting um, interest around the Pulitzer Prize uh, uh, special citation. I know there, were, there was some contestation around that because uh, that was an interesting way of putting another, you know, young black child at the forefront and then saying that this is the way to do, you know, this is the way to lead. Talk to us a bit about that, that bit of uh, contestation around that, uh, around that issue for us. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to punt a little on the Pulitzer question because I, I don't, know that much about it. Uh, you know, there, you know, there is sort of, there was a big debate about whether or not a person who's not a journalist, not governed by a set of ethics, would be deserving of a Pulitzer Prize. But I do think, you know, what does, what does it mean? What does it say about our world? One, I think it acknowledges it's something that's very true and very real. It's that democ uh, the idea of media has become considerably more democratic. That's small d, not big d, right? <laughs> more people can become members of the media and most more people can do good. Darnella Frazier did a good thing. Um, and I am super thrilled whenever she gets recognized for having a good thing. Here's the thing that I think is really interesting. And this showed up in the sentencing of Derek Chauvin, right? When the judge uh, was trying to figure out for how long in which Derek Chauvin should be sent to prison, uh, trauma, trauma to a child is seen as a factor that can increase a sentence. Uh, 
Judge Cahill had decided that since uh, Darnella, who is one of several young people at the scene, seemed happy and they were laughing that they were not traumatized. Now, this in itself leads to a bunch of questions about race, one, some of which we talked about in our class. You know, um, We looked at two competing, two stories in parallel that looked at the lives of a black teenager and a white teenager and asked them, well, who do you think is older? And typically people think the black teenager is older. There's a sense that uh, black people do not have a childhood or a sense of innocence about them. So even though Darnella Frazier is 17, there's still an expectation that she's willing and she should be able to be in the public space and however we choose, right? Uh, but she's also a 17 year old girl. And it's often true that we do not give young black people the space to be children, to make mistakes, to say that it's okay, even if they did not do, hero do a heroic thing, that they can be a child. And so when we think about journalism in that aspect, some of the things that we think about is um, how we talk about children. Are we talking about them as if they're children or are we not? You know, are we expecting them to be superhero because we saw the superheroes because we saw the little rock nine and all those? And the other thing that we don't really talk about it's the actual level of trauma that um, is, takes place when a person is dealing with racism. Now, in the academic sphere, right, we have some terms of it that are breaking through in the mainstream. We have things like discussions of the weathering hypothesis, you know, about the toll that uh, racism takes on the Black physiology. We have discussions about John Henryism, right, the idea that you have to have superhuman strength to outdo the impact of racism in your life, which can seem insurmountable. But what's not often talked about is the actual sadness and psychological trauma that deals with living in these lives. You know, in 2013, uh, the American Psychological Association put out a study saying that we need to do more studies about Black people and depression because we know nothing about it. No one's been interested. Eight, six years later, uh, there was another study talking about the inability of Black people to get funding for doing studies like uh, the relationship between Black people and depression. And so when I think about my job as a reporter and talking to people who had witnessed the murder of George Floyd and have talked to a number of them, uh, that's one thing that I try to remember, that it's not simply a story. And even though we've all seen the video and had an emotional response to it, there's, it does not compare to the fact that you are feet away from watching this murder happen and that you felt disempowered to do something about it. Everyone I talk to, including a teenager, including the teenagers say, God, I wish I could have done more. I wish I could have done something to get Derek Chauvin off his neck and that's what haunts them and I think knowing that they carry that sort of burden is really important. Thank you Robert. We have a number of questions from uh, our audience and I'll just begin to pick out uh, one that sort of dovetails on the question around our lack of understanding, lack of knowledge around uh, African-American mental health. Um, then we'll translate this over to the question of media. And we know we have a, a long history of Black media, uh, Black-owned uh, media outlets, Black newspapers and the Black press that has been structurally dislocated in our media age and particularly around the dislocations of local media and this media consolidation. Uh, one of our uh, mem one of the members of the audience asks us about a question, uh, an issue raised yesterday at NPR. Um, previously to this moment, we had a robust Black media that covered um, a, the depth and diversity of Black life uh, and the Black issues. But without that Black media, we now have a dearth of outlets and the ability to engage in in-depth uh, in coverage of the African-American community. What do, you, what do you think about the idea that in order to grab that community, to understand uh, Black communities, you really need uh, 
a critical mass of black owned media outlets? Well, I think first of all, uh, more is good. I, I, I'm a populist when it comes to the idea of having different outlets of different perspectives. And to me, that includes having things like the Daily Caller, even though they make my job more difficult. Um, so that's to the good. I also question the idea that because uh, we see uh, less robustness within Ebony and Jet, that it's distinct from anything else that's happening in media. I think some of the most powerful things that are happening within ethnic media happen on Twitter, right? The power of Black Twitter is one of the most influential forces today in our politics, in our cult understanding of our culture. It's something that, you know, the impact that it can have to not only drive kind of viral memes, but to actually infiltrate our national discussions about different issues has been incredibly powerful. I would argue, right, that without the power of influencers on Twitter, uh, there would be no true discussion about whether the B should be, the B in Black should be capitalized. I'm not sure there'd be a true discussion about objectivity uh, when it comes to rec rec coverage of the police. All those things have been driven by uh, journalists who have used that platform. The other thing is that you cannot take away sort of the power of places like The Root. And now you see Dr. Candy, he has a organization called The Emancipator um, that are looking to sort of make up some of the ground that was lost in the dismissal and sort of the shrinking of the Negro press as we used to envision it. You know, um, I, you know, when you read the history, it's just shocking to see the reach that those organizations had um, in the early 1900s and into the mid 1950s and 60s. But I um, also think it's true and it's sad that they suffered the consequences that every other news outlet in this country have, uh, has suffered in that, you know, when things got more democratic, um, advertisement dollars dried up. And of course, uh, the, dispropor the disproportionate impact was on that type of media. Right. So I think um, the question really becomes, how do you continue to amplify voices? And to the credit of so many folks, the Alicia Garza's of the world, the Wesley Lowry's of the world, uh, the Nicole Hannah Joneses of the world, they've been able to utilize a platform in a way that has really helped shape the conversation in an exciting way. Robert, we have another question uh, regarding the uh, consolidation, the corporate consolidation uh, of media, particularly of local media. Uh, how do we begin to think about context and nuance when um, so many of our stories come pre-programmed within a pre-given framework uh, and that the stories are then multiplied over and over uh, across so many smaller uh, spaces across the nation um, mm -hmm. such that we no longer get what's going on in our neighborhood. We're getting tidbits of a national story that's already framed from a particular uh, corporate lens. I think uh, that trend is one of the most troubling things in journalism today. It really unnerves me um, because uh, I mean, one, of, one of the things is that uh, truth often doesn't flow from the top down, right? <laughs> like it flows. And so if you're, if you're living within a world in which um, national corporations are shaping how you think about your local views, you're going to miss lots of nuance. I'm not really sure how to fix the problem. It's an incredibly vexing one. I think um, some of the nonprofit structure model that you're seeing, there's a outfit opening in Boston, in, not Boston, in Baltimore that, uh, you know, like Hope does super well. Uh, but it's, it's really hard to envision a world in which uh, there is a Washington Post, but there is not a Washington Afro-American. Um, or that there's not even a Miami Herald in its most robust form. And I hope that somehow through the mix of philanthropy and nonprofit status, it's, a, it's something we can attack. But I do think that, uh, I think now we call them news deserts, that the lack of ability to have um, local news sources that are robust 
um, it's one of the greatest threats to American democracy um, because you don't have people who are watching local government and you don't have folks uh, who could help filter some of the noise when it comes to ideas like critical race theory um, or transgender bathrooms down to a local level distilled into a way that people can um, people can really understand it from their own personal perspective and lived experience and the lived experience of their neighbors. Um, in some ways, I worry that the Washington Post and, you know, the Fox News of the world are getting way too powerful. And ultimately, it will not be a good thing for how we inform ourselves and how we choose on, how we choose who to vote for. Robert, we have one last question from our audience, which is uh, a question that really uh, goes to the heart of your practice as a journalist and uh, you as an individual. Um, how would you say your intellectual practice, your journalistic practice has changed uh, as a result of writing uh, George Floyd's America? And do you see yourself differently as a result of what, what has happened uh, in America, as well as your involvement in, in this story, this award-winning story? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a tough question. I've been thinking about it. Uh, in terms of practice, right, uh, I have to acknowledge and realize that I have joined people at a very fragile time in their lives. Um, and I've, I've, I've seen them at their worst moment. And uh, during, the, there was a reporting stretch during the summer uh, in which uh, seven people just had complete mental breakdowns in a row. And these were not just unofficial sources as we call them, these were folks with title. And, uh, Knowing that, I think it reaffirmed one of my first and prime beliefs as a journalist that we have to remember that everyone we deal with is a person, uh, including the president, including the former president, and they need to be treated as such. The other thing that I think about a lot is my space within my space within the place that I'm reporting, which is something that you know before I reported on this story, I'd say you know pish tosh, whatever, it doesn't matter. But it does matter, to, it does matter to people, you know, like not just in the way that I report, but it does matter to people that they see me as a person who's interested and my race does matter to them. Um, you know, I had so many people saying, I'm just so glad that a black man is here handling this story with a sense of vigor and journalistic respect and esteem that we typically see with white reporters. Um, and while, you know, as much as I would want to shake those ideas off because I, you know, believe in being an honest broker, I do feel like I need to acknowledge more to people that I see them and I understand where they're coming from. So I've, you know, I've considered myself to be an empath uh, from when I started reporting in college, uh, but now I think uh, the times and the story have called for an even greater empathy and a willingness to share uh, parts of my own identity that before I would be a lit uh, considerably more hesitant to share. Well, Robert, it's uh, we're the hour is almost up, and I want to give my colleague uh, Phoebe Zerwick a time to, uh, to a chance to offer some closing comments. Uh, but we, we really want to thank you for uh, what was a really probing, uh, challenging, and indeed an inspiring conversation this afternoon. Uh, so Phoebe, let me turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I suppose I'll end with one last question, because one thing I've observed in this whole conversation is the way Robert is demonstrating what it means to be a truth-finding journalist, empathetic, transparent, and, um, and, but really asking probing questions. And so I just wanna pick up on something I've learned from you, which is um, your, the question you always ask for people is what do you think is the good and bad about being an American? 
Throw it back yeah. at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me tell you, I um, I tell people all the time, um, particularly over the past five years, uh, I've always said journalism is a measure of optimism, right? It's a measure of believing that if you provide people the truth told in a fair and sensitive way, that they will make better decisions, right? That's one of the goals. That's kind of one of the soft spots of it that's embedded in the constitution. And there have been times over the past, uh, there have been times, I, you know, honestly, since the Trump administration, when I saw how polarized and how unwilling people were to come to the middle and meet each other, that, you know, I wondered whether or not it's true and whether or not that's the point. Um, and when I think about that, I think about a conversation that I had with a kid <clears throat> at the uh, University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. And I was there because uh, he was running a step show and at University of Tennessee, black kids and white kids stepped together uh, and they had been stepping together for like 20 years. And over the course of the Trump administration, the black kids decide, you know, they saw that the white students, their white counterparts were thinking about stepping in the right way, that they were using it to profligate stereotypes, that many of them did not, were not concerned with the political sanctity and the emotional lives of their black colleagues. And so they stopped doing it. They stopped stepping together, they stopped stepping together. And the University of Tennessee then had segregated step shows, one black, one white. Um, when I talked to him, you know, I thought this was one of the most heartbreaking stories that I would ever cover. This is before I started learning about George Floyd. And, uh, you know, he said to me, when we get comfortable being uncomfortable, we'll finally get a greater understanding of each other. When we get comfortable being uncomfortable, we'll finally get a greater understanding of each other. And it rings in my head so often as I think about probing these really tough issues because um, I know and I still believe that, you know, judging from the people who read, judging from this sort of engagement, that there are people who are still willing to get a little uncomfortable. And to me, the best part of America is that spirit still exists. And hopefully um, that spirit helps to enable journalists, journalism to do great things and inspire folks. Robert, thank you so much for an elegant way to conclude our conversation. Uh, thank you for all, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the program in journalism, as well as the program in African American studies at Wake Forest University, we truly appreciate your presence and your support, and we wish each and every one of you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Corey. Thanks. Thank you, Robert.